Welcome to Columbia University Library's 10th Annual Library Symposium. We are so delighted to have all of you here today um, and thoroughly excited that we have hit um, the 200 mark and more for registrants today. So we're expecting a few of our out-of-town guests still filtering in in the course of the morning. But um, it's very exciting for us to present this um, each year to surface some of the um, pressing trends that all of us are thinking about and dealing with on our each individual um, campuses. Um, and, and in our professional lives as well. So before we get going on some remarks and introduction of um, our speakers this morning, I wanted to uh, introduce myself, Carol Ann Fabian. I'm the director of the Avery Architectural and Fine Arts Library here at Columbia. And um, I want to do a little housekeeping because I know it's on everybody's mind. You all had a nice breakfast, I hope. Um, and I hope that in the course of the day, you'll be so inspired and so excited about what you're hearing that you're going to tweet a little bit. So um, there's our, our Twitter hashtag. Um, and also, for those of you who are uh, wanting to use your laptops and connect to the wireless, uh, the instructions are there as well. Um, the Twitter hashtag, if you can't see that, is C-U-L-S-Y-M-P-13. -S um, other housekeeping news, the restrooms. <laughs> um, if you uh, leave the auditorium, make a right, go to the end of the hall. On your left is the men's, and for the women, take the stairs down one level, and it's on your left there, straight ahead. Also, someone left their reading glasses in the breakfast room. So I'll, um, my seat's over there, and you can discreetly pop down and pick those up after. Um, the next item is, of course, the many, many thank yous that we need to make to uh, so many people who have uh, helped us uh, bring this program forward today. And uh, first among them is um, the leadership of Columbia University Libraries, Jim Neal, um, for supporting this each of the 10 years that it's been offered. And this year, um, our planning committee was led by Damon Jaggers, um, who, uh, with very good humor, thankfully, um, put up with all of the ins and outs of the planning and uh, helped us shape what we hope will be a very exciting program for you. Um, behind the scenes, there have been a cast of uh, thousands uh, that bring forward any uh, program of this nature. And among them, I'd just like to mention um, CEDARS, the Center for Digital Research and Scholarship, who helped us with our web presence, um, the Reference Coordinating Committee, and librarians from across the Columbia University Libraries who are helping in various roles today, camera person, marketing person, people running the audience with mics, um, guides throughout the building. You'll see lots of Columbia people, and anyone is certainly help, uh, happy to help you uh, in the course of the day. Uh, in addition to this, we'd like to thank our host, um, the Watson Library. Here is the business library in this building. We'll be having lunch in their facility. And also uh, Columbia School of Business, which is uh, graciously uh, allowing us to use this auditorium and provide all the technical support for today's program. And last but not least, our sponsors, um, who you see here, but I will read them off, um, <laughs> Atlas Systems, EBSCO, Elsevier, Gail Sinaj, uh, Sungage Learning, ProQuest, Routledge, and Springer. And then finally, uh, my colleagues uh, who were in the planning committee with me, uh, Mary Junta, Pamela Graham, Barbara Rockenbach, Jane Lin Winland, and again, Damon Jaggers. So thanks to all of you for helping us bring the program forward today. So I'm just going to make a few very brief remarks about um, what we hope to accomplish today. How does this feel to some people? <laughs> I knew who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have changed several times since then. Um, it seems to me that Alice had a few things to say to many of us as we um, approach our days and hopefully with good humor. Um, and her sentiment perhaps expresses the daily experience of a campus context uh, where changes abound but are not always clearly understood or predictable. Um, rather, the changes that we're all seeing are continually trending, which gives us the titling of our, our program today, in many competing directions all at the same time. And it's for us to parse that out and to choose directions that will both um, secure or support uh, the efforts of our universities and of um, the general learning enterprise as a whole. Um, today, we'll explore some of the drivers motivating those changes in higher education, and the day is structured in a way to come from the, the most uh, global uh, perspectives 
down to the research environment, and then to drill a little closer into the campus context with our faculty, and then to the library universe in particular. But each of those um, panels will bring to bear, I think, clearer focus on why we are seeing a lot of um, churn in the ways we think about how we do what we do, and how we look forward to these opportunities to be different and better and um, more diverse professionals as the uh, field emerges. So um, today, uh, as I say, we will have um, views from opinion leaders and from scholars, as well as examine the research findings that help us better understand uh, the complexity pre presented by the disciplinary differences in the research practices on campus today. We'll also be uh, welcoming two case studies from libraries, uh, reimagined and repositioned as key actors in the rapidly evolving space, not just reactors to uh, a set of circumstances that are placed at our doorstep. In this case, we're then not chasing the trend line, but rather working to shape it. And so, we're not Alice really, but Andy, a little bit out there on the edge. Um, so they always say, and I think it's true, time changes things, but actually, you actually have to change it yourself. So um, next I'd like to welcome our first speaker, familiar to many of you. Um, Malcolm Brown is the director of the Educause Learning Initiative since 2009. Um, he's been on the board for the Horizon Report since its uh, inception in 2004 and has served as chair of the board of the New Media Consortium as well. Um, he holds dual degrees from the University of California at Santa Cruz, as well as um, having had several Fulbright scholarships and a PhD in German studies from Stanford University. Um, Malcolm, I'd like to welcome you up. Uh, well, good morning, and thank you to the organizers, Damon and Barbara, and others for inviting me here. It's great to be with you here today. Um, what I'd like to do is think about this session as being a bit of sense-making. There's a lot that's going on, and it's one thing to note what's going on. It's another thing to know what it means for us and what we're trying to accomplish at our campuses. And that means also that uh, this doesn't have to be a linear presentation. Uh, if we need to stop and talk about some things as they come up, please raise your hand. Let's have a chat. So I invite interaction uh, on this. I don't need to get through all my slides. All right. Uh, okay, uh, the image isn't the best, but what is this thing? Which, do you know which scale it is? Very good. How many of you have played piano? Oh good, yeah, so you know exactly what this is. It has the fingering in it. Do you know what this is also? This is a pattern. It's a pattern. So patterns are interesting things, and I'd like us to uh, Think about patterns as we go through this, even through the day. Think about patterns and what they mean for us. So I'd like to do a little bit of a warm-up. Which line is longer? <laughs> right, they're the same, right? No, not quite. <laughs> okay, I learned this trick from this guy. This is a great TED Talk, by the way. So if you have a moment, um, it's a really, really engaging one. But what I think what's interesting is that patterns, we know that optical illusion trick, we all, that's the pattern we have. And sometimes the things we think we're seeing really don't conform to the pattern. So patterns are very, very interesting. They're very enabling. They're very important for what we do. But at certain times, perhaps, <coughs> they might be a little confining or prevent us from seeing what innovations are available to us at the moment. So, uh, I like to start my talks by giving away the punchline right away. And it occurred to me, I kind of got a bit of enlightenment, if you will, at the grocery store one day. Um, you know, that, that sort of zone, in between zones, you finished your shopping, you're waiting to check out, so you're standing there, and you get to peruse the literature that's in the aisle. <laughs> <right? laughs> so, you, no, no, you can, you know, right? You find, you discover all these wonderful facts you never would never know before. Uh, so, but just by working in there, you can find out things like this. <laughs> you didn't know that the Hubble telescope actually photographs heaven, or that the aliens landed and actually were back. In the but you know, the interesting thing about these aliens is that politically, they're very, very fickle. Because, say, so note this, but then now look at this. <laughs> Same alien later, back uh, with the post president. So all this stuff is interesting. So, but this is what caught my attention. I'm standing there and waiting to check out, and I see this magazine. 
And if this discussion has gotten to the checkout aisle of your grocery store, <laughs> that kind of means that, wow, OK, something really powerful is going on here. Something really is changing. And there's, there's a real question. Should this be the classroom of the future, where you're sitting at your own breakfast table, perhaps, or in a cafe with your computer with an internet connection? Is this how you're going to be going to, to college in the future? So in order to formulate this, I have to go back to this notion of the koan uh, and enlighten it a little bit. Everyone knows what a koan is, right? The sound of one hand clapping. It's the little puzzle that the Zen master gives you to confound your thinking, so to break you free of your patterns and to move ahead. So, and the nice thing about koans is that they're actually everywhere. So here's one I came across. Yeah. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that is one actually that the master could have given you, right? This is okay. But anyway, so the biggest change in higher education right now is change. And that's, it's, either, it's either something profound or something very, very trivial. But if you think about, you know the academy well. How, how, how welcome is it to change and changing its ways? Not much, but change is happening. And I think that's the big thing that's going on now. And that's the big message is that change is finally starting to happen in the academy. OK. So one way to think about the change is post. Post is obviously from Latin meaning after. And in many ways, we are entering into kind of a post, what we could call a post-traditional era in higher education. And let's look at some numbers. So here are some numbers already there on the left. And here are some labels that explain them, but they're not matched up. So I want you to take a, a minute, look at that, and can you, can you guess which label <coughs> matches with which number? Let's just go through this. So the first one is that, according to a recent survey, our students can't go 10 minutes without checking into the internet, either on their cell phone or their tablet or some sort of other connected device. That's rather interesting. The next one is that in the past couple of years, yes? Yeah, I was just wondering, these are stats from 2012, or? I believe these are from 2011, 2012. 2011. Uh, at the time this was done, there were about 50 partnerships between uh, not-for-profits and for-profits. There's a change. Um, and this is the number of students enrolled in for-profit college in the pace of two decades. It's gone up from 1% to this number. And then obviously, finally, this one. This is the compounded growth rate of students who have taken at least one online course across all post-secondary education. These are, these, are, these are real numbers, and these are, these are um, signifiers of change. Uh, also, this notion of post. Uh, this, Randy Bass is an associate provost at Georgetown. He's a professor of English. And I like this article. This appeared in the Educause Review. And he talks, he talks there about we're entering into what he calls the post-course era. And here's, his quote is that we have reached the end of assuming that the formal curriculum it really has a monopoly on the key learning experiences our students were going to have. He points to things like uh, learning communities, collaborative work, research, service learning, and other sorts of things, these sort of interconnectors between these course experiences are really going to be the, the, the really deep learning experiences our students are going to enjoy. So that's a little bit of a change of our thinking. Now, the Pew Internet folks, they did this survey, and they asked two questions. So they said, they said, OK, here are two alternatives. By 2020, things will be very different, or they won't be so different. So I'm going to put up, ask you, how many people would agree with, with assertion number one? That they're not going to be very different uh, in 2020. Well, I'm in the room. I'm sorry. I meant in the room. If anyone, did anyone, would anyone agree with number one as opposed to how about number two? Well, yes, you agree. So the, the numbers they came up with was even uh, less radical than in here. So I think that's indicative. All of us here in the academy, working in the academy day in day out, we sense that there's going to be a lot of change. In, and 2020 is only six and a half years from now, which for the academy is uh, a blink of an eye. So when I think about all that's going on, I like to characterize it uh, kind of talking about it as swirl. Things are swirling about. Now, there's this notion of student swirl that you may have heard, which is instead of a student having a linear trajectory from uh, matriculation to degree award, you know, I come to, say, Columbia, I come to, to Yale, Harvard, something like that, freshman year, sophomore year, junior, senior, it's a linear progression. They are going to be kind of having a customized path where they might pull in some online 
credits from one place, uh, maybe some credits over here, and put together more of a unique package. And this is what's called student swirl, this notion of a nonlinear trajectory towards your degree. But swirl, I think, is a nice uh, image for us in terms of what we're experiencing. Now, when we talk about swirl, obviously, um, there are some nice, unnice swirls, like a hurricane or a tornado. <laughs> but in terms of higher education, I would talk about it this way. We're seeing things in higher education now beginning to de-aggregate and then re-aggregate. So they're kind of coming apart and they're going back together again. So that's one way of looking at it, is that there's all this sort of unaggregation or de-aggregation and re-aggregation that's going on right now. Also, higher education is reaching outside of itself in a way that's really unprecedented. But also the outside is reaching into higher education. So we have this inside-outside effect that's happening, uh, kind of even as we speak. We're seeing whole new models, not just tinkering at the edges, not just saying, let's try some iPads, or let's try these sort of incremental sustaining type of innovations. We're seeing disruptive ones. We're seeing um, powerful new models and paradigms that are being experimented with right now and may be a key to the academy's future. And we're seeing feedback and feed forward. So even in the curricular space, it's no longer just a, the professor or the instructor giving feedback to the students, but it's more circular, it's more interactive, it's more mutual. And then finally, of course, we're seeing new products, markets, and value propositions, which if you are familiar with Clayton Christensen and his literature about sustaining and disruptive innovation, you know, this is when you talk about whole new markets, new value propositions, there you're really talking about disruptive innovation. Okay. So again, this is, these are patterns. What we've been doing in the past are patterns. Patterns are important, but they may be confining. And patterns are usually made up of rules, saying what you can and can't do, what you should and shouldn't do. And so what I'm just suggesting is that since we're in a time of swirl and change, these are the things that we need to no longer take for granted as we move along. So I think all of us in the academy are all too familiar with the pressures that the academy is under right now. So there's no uh, a big need to um, Go into them deeply, but first I'm going to pause here. Are there any, anyone have any questions at this point? Any, any um, assertions of innocence? That's sort of thing. Not yet. Okay, fine. So this is this is an article that also appeared in Education College Review that I found most helpful to kind of summarize where a lot of the challenges lies for the academy. So I, there's no need for me to recapitulate this article in great detail. But just a few things that are pretty obvious here. One, obviously, is cost. So if you look at how, the, over the past 15 years, the consumer price index has gone up and how much uh, tuition has gone up, obviously, we all know about these things, that the tuition factor is increasingly a problem for higher education in general, the cost. We know that student debt uh, now exceeds credit card debt for the United States, um, contributing or compounding, if you will, the cost issue of what's going on. Uh, right one now. second, please. What was the number on college tuition? What was the, that number? The, the previous slide? That one was 325. Thank you. Um, I mean, some people say it's, you know, it's maybe 300 or something. In any case, we all know that tuition rate increases has far outpaced any other sort, even health care increases uh, over the past uh, <coughs> decade, decade and a half. Um, here is an interesting graph. This is showing us how much investment there has been in the post-secondary phase by venture capital. And so it might be hard to read, so let me see if I can do this. So in the time that's chronicled or um, documented in this particular chart, two billion has been invested in the higher education space outside of higher education, two billion dollars. And as of 2011, uh, 438 Startups have received venture capital funding of one size or another. This is a lot of money. I mean, when I was director of academic community at Dartmouth, I was thinking, gee, if someone would just give me $100,000, it would be like a windfall, much less a million, million and a half. Um, so this is, this is kind of that outside-in effect that I was talking about. We're seeing um, the, the game is changing. The other source of money, obviously, that's influencing the course of things are the foundations. The foundations are taking a much more prominent role, like the Gates Foundation, Seems like every time you look under a, under a stone in the teaching and learning space, there's a Gates Foundation initiative going on underneath it. So again, it's, it's very, very different. It's a very, very different area that we're talking about. And this, again, I'm sorry the colors have washed out a bit here, but this documents the other problem that higher education is facing, which is student completion. 
less of a problem for schools like Columbia, Harvard, Yale, those sorts of things. But for the vast majority of higher education, it's, it's, these numbers are really depressing. Um, so you can see here in public education, Delaware has the best numbers, going up to 55% in four years, down to a place like Idaho. Um, so this is, again, a real challenge that we're facing as a community. Also, Mahathy points out that there's a cottage industry aspect to the way the academy has done teaching and learning that may not be so successful in the future. By that he means, think about all the four-year institutions in the United States. Think about your Psychology 1 course or your Psychology 101 course. You might have three or four faculty teaching that in a year. Each one of them reinvents the course, more or less, to suit his or her needs. So that's done three or four times at each school each year, multiplied by what, however many it might be, 3,000 institutions across the country. That's a lot of reinvention of Psych 101. Now, obviously, there are, there, are, there, are, there are grand traditions within the academy about academic freedom, about the faculty member being totally in charge of the course, and so why shouldn't they have the right to reinvent the course as they see fit? And I'm not disputing that so much. All I'm saying, in this new era that we find ourselves, this cottage industry notion, the way we approach our teaching and learning and development of our curriculum, may not be so successful. Because you know how the profits do it, the for profits? They have a team. So if they need to teach, so they, there are two main things they do differently. One is they have a team to send. The faculty member really just says, here's the content, here's what you need to cover. And then they send in a swarm of team of instructional designers, graphic artists, instructional technologists who do all the rest. They have mentors and coaches, all in addition to the faculty member. And then they take that course and they run it again and again and again to get efficiency out of it. So the question is, what should, and I don't have the answer. I'm not saying necessarily that this is the right or this is the one size that should fit all. But I think it raises questions for us in the academy. What should our model be? What should our paradigm be for teaching and learning going forward? Is there something that we can learn from that model that might help us accomplish our, our, our obligations uh, better in the future? So the course today, I think of it as, can you, do you think you know anyone who could do all these things well? <laughs> has all the skills in their portfolio that could do all these things well, running solo as a kind of a lone ranger. And if they did, if they're a faculty member and they're hired and promoted by research, do they have time to address all these issues? Uh, Herbert Simon once famously said that instruction is going from a solo sport to a team sport, and I think that's true. So the question is, are we keeping too much in the faculty by expecting them to juggle all these balls in addition to the time crunches, and do it two or three times a semester, perhaps. So I'd like now to uh, come back to a notion of swirl a little bit and talk about how some of these patterns are beginning to play out uh, concretely in the environment around us at schools and other things like that. Before I do, anyone with comment? Um, yeah, please. Just what the completion rates at for profits were in comparison to Public institutions? That's a really good question. Um, and actually, they're not so great either, point of fact. I hear University of Phoenix is around 34, 35, 40 percent, something like that. So there are some, there are some struggles going on there. I think uh, student completion, and that's where you'll see a lot of the models here are hovering around this problem space for the academy. And um, that's one of the reasons, because I think we all see it as a universal kind of issue. I mean, it's one thing for a, a school of the stature of a place like Columbia or Dartmouth or Harvard and the caliber of students that they pull in, you know, they have 95% completion rates. So you sit there and you say, well, what problem? We don't have a problem. Of course, they don't. But everywhere else, there is a, a real problem. Any other comments, uh, things you want to share? Yes, please. Uh, maybe the only other trend to mention is the don't go to college at all trend. And interesting that the guy, uh, is running uncollege.com. Yes. He had articles in the New York Times and Wall Street Journal the same week just sharing his philosophy about why you don't need to go to college at all and how you should spend your money investing in yourself. Yeah, well, I mean, and you also see that the pundits, the bloggers who are saying, look, if you can't like that student from the magazine that showed at the outset, if I can sit down someplace and with my Mac do a MOOC here, do some online here, they'll say, what are colleges for? Do we need even need them? And even some of the, the more um, uh, provoking, if you will, uh, predictions are that you know, 10 years from now, there will only be 10 institutions left. 
So who knows what they were thinking about that radically. But the, these are why, I mean, it's interesting. They're actually putting these things on the table. And some people are putting money with it. They're not just saying, well, gee, maybe we don't, we don't need to go to college anymore. There's a guy there who is saying, yes, I can, I can, I can make this happen. I can facilitate this. So um, yeah, things are different. It's not like they were 10 years ago, that's for sure. And it's not like the dot-com boom. We all remember the dot-com boom from 1998, 99. And everyone was saying that, yes, online is the future. Um, I remember a, a, a quote that I, uh, and sometimes I produced that was published in the Chronicle saying that the, the future of higher education is outside the classroom back in 99. Well, that didn't happen. But here, I think things were a bit different. If nothing else, if nothing else, uh, my role at Dartmouth for many years was director of academic computing. And when I talked to my former colleagues who were still in that business, they say that, gee, up until this year, um, the amount, number of times that I was in the provost's office to talk about teaching and learning campus, zilcho. And this year I've been in three or four times. <laughs> so the senior administration is being really engaged around this. I mean, witness Virginia, right? That's that, that whole story. Um, so if you didn't need convincing, that story by itself would convince you. And that is one of the reasons why I think we're in a very, very different space than, say, at the dot-com boom with respect to teaching and learning. We have engagement, at least for the moment, of the senior administration, and everyone's saying, look, look at all the ways that all the schools are jumping into the Coursera and edX pods. You know, to get into edX, you have to pay $5 million just to get into the game. That's the skin in the game. That's like if you're playing poker. That's like what you throw into the pot before the hand is even dealt. So why would a school invest $5 million just to be in that pond? Interesting, isn't it? Any other comments? OK. So what we're going to do now for the next few minutes is just explore some models and technologies uh, that I think are showing up in the teaching and learning space that I think are interesting and might help our thinking in terms of like where we're going and where things are going in general with teaching and learning and post-secondary education. So this is an exploration. Now technology, what's this? It's a foundation. Now how many of you, when you are at home, say, and you think about improving your, your wherever you live, your home, your apartment, your condo, wherever it might be, think about what I really should do is do something about the foundation, unless it's a problem. But you're probably thinking more about your carpets, painting your walls, uh, maybe new appliances. How often do you go to bed and I think, I really should you know, do something to spruce up the foundation of my house or something like that. <laughs> you don't. Obviously, we don't. You know, we want to we wanna focus where we live. And not, but the foundation, obviously, is critical. But we don't really think about it so much. We just expect it to be there. So technology should do this. It should be, it should be the foundation. So that's why I'm starting with it. But I think where the interesting thing will be is when we get into talking about um, uh, some of the, uh, the new models that are, are showing up. But like a foundation, the foundation also is not just supportive, but it also defines the outline of the building, right? You can't build outside of where the foundation is. So these technologies are exactly the same, so play the same role. They're best when they're out of sight and they're just working. They also are definitional in the sense of the shapes and the possibilities that you have at your disposal. So that's why, just to keep the, the whole technology thing in perspective, this is the, uh, not the thing that should drive the car. The first thing, and I'm sure you know all about, you've been following this, is analytics. So it's no news, analytics is, is really, really sort of big. Um, and it, it's really going to play an important role as we move forward, I think, because it's, it's, it's going everywhere. Um, as a matter of fact, remember this from the graduate? So I think updating this instead of saying plastics, I think it's analytics. Um, so there's this, anyone know of a site called the Quantified Self? Yep, you've heard of it? So what's, what, what's, what goes on there? It's a, it's a site that, that brings together measurements of what you've done that day, all of the different things, whether it's what you ate or how many steps you've walked or what your blood pressure is and, and putting right. together a picture of yourself from those quantities. That's right. So in this, what can I learn about myself? So there was one post I thought was kind of interesting. This guy was training for either a marathon or a triathlon or something pretty extreme. And he would take his pulse rate every time he got up in the morning. And he was trying to discover if in fluctuations of his pulse rate, whether he feels his body's under strain, under strain and maybe he needs to ratchet back his training. So it's that sort of thing. It's like if we start collecting numbers on each other, if we quantify it ourselves, we can discover things on it. We've seen people tracking how many cups of coffee and then how they are and tracking their moves. I mean, it's really interesting. So this whole notion of analytics, collecting data, and trying to tell a story, 
has a big context, also uh, sort of micro context, as in the quantified self. But I'm sure how many, let me ask a question here. At your campus, are you, do you have like a learning analytics module program in place? Put up your hand if you do. Not so many yet. Um, how, many, how many of you know what I'm talking about if I say learning analytics? Some of you do? Okay, so uh, imagine that you had your, your busy little computers tracking your students, and they can track. Well, let me just go on here. How many of you have a learning management system in place? We all do, right? Okay, so learning management system, what happens there? The students come and go, they check into their course websites, they post discussion forum posts, they maybe take an exam, they maybe access the syllabus, they all sorts of things on there. While this is happening, the LMS has always been faithfully logging all that activity, putting in log files that only system administrators are brave enough to take a look at. So, but talk about patterns, there's a pattern there, right? That's information, that's data. And if you could capture the data and actually analyze it, then it's could talk, telling you stories about what those students are doing or specifically not doing. So that's what analytics proposes to do. And learning analytics is one that's trying to grab a picture on what the students are doing and two, two very, very fundamental aspects of learning analytics. One, I'm trying to see which students might be in trouble, which students are showing signs of disengagement in the course so that I can then go intervene and pull them back into the course, perhaps, and make more students successful in the course that might have been the case without that. So that's one. Well, let me just tell the story. I'm going to do this, and then we can stop and hear any questions about learning analytics. So anyway, so we all have this LMS, and it has, as I said, it sits on data. And a lot of them have a very sophisticated database, like Oracle, because it's a very, very sophisticated, data-rich environment that makes the LMS be what it is. So now, and then we thought the next step when you got the LMS running was that you connected it to your student information system so it could exchange data between that so that you could get automatically what courses are being run, send student data back to the SIS, like their grades and stuff like that. So that was kind of cool and a nice bit of integration. Then you started to say, okay, how about learning analytics? Maybe we could grab that data and do something with it that might help our students by tracking them. So the way learning analytics is beginning to evolve is that we have at the one level, what we call course analytics, that is analytics about how the students are doing in a specific course. And that breaks, and then you also have what are called dashboard analytics. I'll get into that in a second, what exactly that is. Um, so the course analytics tries to measure the student engagement, like how many times are they logging in, how many discussion form posts are they making, things like that. Um, and it's really interesting, the early returns are that some of these mechanisms are very effective at spotting the students who are looking like they're going to be disengaging. Uh, and now the early experiments are that can actually reach into the student artifacts themselves and look for uh, markers of are the students getting to a conceptual and expertise framework with this content in a way that really matches the course objectives. And if you're a faculty member and start seeing that your students are not going into the space, then you might readjust your curriculum in midstream in order to help promote more of this. And then actually up promoting up to the, at the institution level, the academic analytics, how are all the students doing across all the various divisions and courses, and then maybe even the business analytics of the institution. So this is sort of the, the, the way that learning analytics is, is becoming a factor on campuses, and I think will be a very, very important one in the future. This is an example of one type of learning analytics, and all it's doing is discussion is, is tracking who is responding to whom within the course website. This is called SNAP. And you can see, unfortunately, because it's washed out, you can't quite see the connectors. But the ones in the middle of the ones have lots of connections, they're showing engagement with the other with their fellow students. And the ones in the periphery are ones that maybe are showing very, very little engagement. So now you as a faculty member go in there and say, I'm going to find those students on the periphery and say, I'll reach out to them and say, what's going on? Right. Can I ask a question? Yeah, please. Have they correlated that with student success in terms of grades? And just because you're connected to me doesn't necessarily equate to a more successful student in terms of grades. Um, it depends how you mean that question. Um, the students who are on the periphery here typically are the ones who, and from these projects are typically ones who do less well or drop out. These are early, early warning systems or markers, if you will, that these are the students who are in danger of, of not doing well, not engaging, and potentially not completing the course. 
So the, the whole aspiration is to say, okay, can I be proactive instead of just letting that happen? <coughs> can I, in the middle of the course, actually reach out to them and actually engage them a little bit? Yeah. I have a question about the learning analytics, because it sounds like that is sort of operationally defining learning as like being logged into an LMS. Yes, good. And I feel like good. that is, you know, if you've ever taught, you sort of know you might have a student who does yep. everything perfectly that does not, they read every assignment on time, and maybe you notice in your classroom interactions that's not the same thing as learning. So are there other kind of variables that can factor in or other layers? That's a really good question. Uh, and that's a whole talk unto itself, as you can imagine. But it's a really, and there's a lot of, um, very heartfelt discussions about there is no learning or learning. Because if all it's doing is counting the number of times I log into the website, that doesn't measure learning. And I think most people would agree. Uh, to be said is that if you are trying to do is you're trying to help student completion rates, this is a good tool. This proves to be an effective tool. So you can say, okay, it's not really measuring their learning. Logging into the website is a proxy for their engagement. Engagement, as we know, is a fundamental key aspect of learning. If you're not engaged, you're not going to learn well or deeply. So you could say from that argument that, yes, I am at least trying to observe the contours of their engagement that has to do with their learning. And if I help them with this, they're going to, the chances of them learning are going to be much more improved. The other, let's go back here to this diagram. The artifacts is, I think, really more interesting in this, in which you could say, by using rubrics, look at students, say, written artifacts, and say, do these bear markers or evidence of critical thinking, for example, the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy. And if you can, um, if you can observe that, then you could sort of get a sense, is, is my curriculum succeeding or not? Are my students getting to this point of uh, mastery with the content so they can actually begin to critically think about it as opposed to just regurgitating it? Yes, sir. I guess I don't understand the uh, bullseye shape in the next graph because uh, and things that are far out, I mean, I would sort of think that things on the top mean good grades or something like that. Uh, okay, let me just, yeah, let me explain this a little, bit, a little better. So what this is measuring is the number of times the students respond to someone's blog post. They post a blog post or a discussion <coughs> forum post. The number of times they comment on someone else's, the number of times they reach out to someone. So it's just measuring that. That's all this one is measuring. And it... It says, I mean, if you strike up more conversations and talk to more people, you're more engaged than if you don't. So it's really trying to say, is this a way of representing or showing or, or looking at seeing the, number, the amount of engagement? So the more people I reach out to, the more engaged I am. So the ones in the periphery that have, can, unfortunately, you can't see this, that have only a single line, they have far fewer engagements, and therefore, they are at risk. Now, it doesn't say for sure that they're going to fail, but there, there's something you want to keep an eye on. Yeah. Yeah, I wanted to just go back to uh, the, what you just mentioned earlier about uh, critical thinking skills. So, um, you know, we all know that it takes a long time to develop that skill. And I think the fact is that, you know, as education is moving online, one course, well, one course ticking online will not, you know, guarantee students to have that critical thinking skill. And if it's moving online, the transition, and there are more and more courses just online, will students probably not develop it at all, or it's hard to say, right? It goes back to learning analytics. Yeah, you know, that's an interesting question you raised. The one thing I'm learning in my old age here is that when I say, oh, that'll never happen, watch out. Yeah. I say, okay, be careful. Because at one point we would say that the computers will never beat us at Jeopardy, right? And now they can whip us at Jeopardy. And I, 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 say, I say that because I feel like it's constantly, there's engaging, of course, but it's distracting. You know, students are not being able to focus right. at, at some time, too. I don't know. Yeah, but, on the, but uh, on the other side, we have students in our lecture halls who are zoning out yeah. and reading email and falling asleep and stuff like that. So, I mean, I think this, to casting is this black and white that online is always going to be impoverished compared to face-to-face, -to -face, or that face-to-face -face inherently is superior, necessarily, in all cases, to online. Mm -hmm. I think we need to be careful about that kind of thinking and say, what, what's the best in these areas? How can we promote the best practices and use them? Either either or, or um, Nick, one more, then I'm going to move on. Was there a, a question back there? From my own experience, only last year, in the fall, being in a class, two classes, in which um, online engagement was a required part of the course, a minimum number of posts per week, your own, and then responding to your classmates. That does not seem to me to me to be a very true 
picture of engagement when the engagement is required for the grade. If engagement were solely voluntary, um, and you know, if it was enough to say, are you looking at the syllabus? Are you looking at course mm -hmm. rubrics online? But when it is required, I'm not sure that it's really a true metric of engaging in the course. Well, I, yeah, I mean, I, I think in that instance, you, you, there could be some discussion. I'll, I guess I'm just pointing to tools that are going to help us do some things better. Um, and this is not a panacea. I'm not saying learning analytics is going to be a panacea and make us uh, do everything right all the time. There's a lot of discussion working out needs to be. I'm running out of time, so I think I need to, I'm sorry, but there will be some discussion afterwards, right? So, sorry, I just only got two minutes left, and I got all of these. <laughs> <laughs> this is Signals. This is another uh, example of learning analytics where the faculty gets this display. You see your students, and you can see this uses a traffic light metaphor. Uh, green is good, yellow is mm, and red is mm, maybe there's a problem. Again, what you're trying to see are there patterns here, and if a pattern looks like it's going from green to red, you might want to intervene. Ask the student what's going on. And you know, it turns out intervention and nudging turns out to be very, very powerful and can be very effective. Um, here's one from uh, Central Piedmont. This is what I call dashboarding. So the dashboarding means I'm not just looking at a student's individual course performance, but rather trying to see where they are as a whole across their courses. So this is more of a tool for the student advisor. And what they are looking at are kind of bringing services, improving faculty skills, and then having this dashboard that looks like this, and this is totally washed out. So, um, but anyway, if you could see this, you would see that it brings together information that is uh, across the students. It's about the students' learning styles, personality types, things like that. So you have a more rounded picture of your student, and therefore can decide what intervention strategy might be better. This is all found in analytics. This is another pattern that we're seeing emerging, which is a, this is called the Greek Compass at Austin Peay State University. And what they, this is, this is a tool for students to figure out how, what their path should be to their degree. And this is trying to match uh, courses, recommend courses to their skills. It's a bit like Amazon, trying to take the best of that and trying to help the student in a more helpful way, and rather than just handing them a catalog and saying, have a nice day. This is really trying to give them constructive suggestions as to how they need to go forward. <coughs> E-con e content is another, and I'm sure you as librarians are familiar with what's going on here. You see these four things I think are very, very powerful, and this is why I think e-content, it's more than just e-textbooks, e-content I think is going to be a very important technology as we go forward. Um, you probably know about the, what Indiana University is doing and now many universities are doing where they're actually going out and buy, buying volume sort of discounts or publishing uh, textbooks so they can then provide them to their students for far less than they could before. So this is a change, this is a model change where the university becomes the textbook provider rather than just saying to the students, you know, here's the text, hope you find it. Uh, OER, we're seeing a lot in open educational resources. We're seeing a lot of uptakes in Florida and Ohio and Washington State and others, actually whole statewide initiatives trying to encourage the use of open educational resources in the curriculum. Uh, we're seeing new publishing models, flat world knowledge, you can access the, uh, the book, the textbook online for free and pay for printed copies if you like. And then finding uh, tools like iBook authors that will give faculty and others actual tools to prepare their own textbooks if they so choose. Uh, mobile, okay, let's play this again. This is a, another numbers game. In the context of mobile technology, can you guess what the labels are gonna be for these? I'm gonna go through it really quickly because we're running out of time. So 600 million at the bottom, that's the number of smartphones that were sold last year. Uh, if you had a million dollars, you could buy all the apps in the Apple yeah. iPhone store, <laughs> if you wanted to do that. Uh, the average price for an app is a dollar seventy one. Now, can you remember, remember 10 years ago how much an application for your computer costs? Compared to this, you can try things out and fail. You can throw these away if it turns out not to be the little gizmo that really suits your needs, um, which I think is really kind of fabulous. So that's how many applications you can then choose from in the Apple Store alone. And this is not Android, just this is iOS. Uh, and 56% of those are free. Are free. So, and I'm gonna take you through, show you a few of the, the apps I think are really kind of clever. Because if you think about what's happening, your mobile device, this little thing, unlike your old computer, this thing can see, it can sense in a sense with the accelerometer in it, and it can be touched. So there are lots of things this thing can do that the laptop never could. So here's one called World Lens. 
You take your cameras, if you're traveling abroad to see a sign, thank you. You take a photograph, boom, it translates it for you. Here's another one, my script calculator. You actually write with a little stylus your formula. It will decode that and give you the result. Money reader, this is actually an accessibility one. You take a, a photo of a bill or something, it will tell you what it is and how much it's for. Uh, back in time, this is a little app that you can use to check history on certain things. It has very nice and helpful displays. And even a little gizmo like this, which helps you in this age of collaborative learning, this, all this does is help you uh, find meeting times for a group. But now you can do it on a little, on a little gizmo. OK. In terms of models, um, we're going to look at them very quickly on outside to the inside, or outside to going to the inside. That means um, outside organizations coming into the academy. Do uh, you know about straighter line? Everyone kind of knows about straight line, so I'm going to have to zip through this because we're almost out of time here. But anyway, uh, their model looks like this. You pay by the month. Um, you can get through your courses pretty quickly. Um, they have individual on-demand on support for you. Uh, and they actually have a plan for, tran for uh, transferring your credits to their partner institutions. Uh, and this is their roster of what they do, what they think, how great their package is. But there are some interesting innovations happening in this space. And here are some of their partners, and some of them um, are pretty established institutions. Okay, uh, outside, inside out, higher education is now getting into outsourcing its curriculum, which was probably unthinkable uh, just a little while ago. Uh, one, you can hire uh, companies to help tutor your students if they're running into trouble. But also, if you came across this uh, degree program at University of Southern California, you wouldn't know that this is an outsourced program, it is. They're working with this company called U2, and U2 is a provider of, a, of services that will help you get up and going in the online environment very, very quickly. And they have a bunch of these. Uh, you never heard, I'm sure you never heard of these institutions. <laughs> They're working with academic degrees. So this is, this is a new model for, for the academy. To you or U2? To you. To you is the name of the firm. Can you take enough credits from these things to get like, your degree? You can get, can you like go to Emory and, and take a whole bunch of those? At USC, they're constructing the whole curriculum online. So yes, you can. OK, uh, College of Nursing, they're working with another company called Academic Partnerships to do much the same thing. And here we come to the MOOCs, which is this weird thing of the outside going to the inside, the inside going to the outside. The interesting thing that's happening in the MOOC space right now are two things. We're getting into credentialing. They're getting to be credentialed, which is interesting. And already the MOOC 2.0 is coming into view, which is not so much the course, but there being a flipped classroom resource. Let me see if I can explain that really quickly. So MOOC credentialing, we see these happening. Uh, if you want to take a proctored exam, Pearson has a center near you that you can go to, pay a fee, and you can take an exam and get credit for the course. Um, Georgia State is one school that says, yeah, sure, we'll consider giving you credit for a MOOC. Come talk to us, and we'll figure it out. Uh, the American Council of Education recommended that these five Coursera courses be considered as credit worthy. So it's moving into the space. These MOOCs are not just sort of sitting out as outliers. And we heard about this, I'm sure you've heard about this at the University of California. They're saying that they're requiring that the institution uh, accept credit if a student's trying to get into a, bottle, into a gateway course as a bottleneck, can't get in because they don't have capacity at the school. They're saying, okay, you can go outside, get an online course, get that credit, and move on with your career. Uh, and then this is the flipped side, but the flipped classroom is obviously where the content is done outside of class time and class time is used for discussion. They went, they were having, they were struggling with the physics courses, they went to edX, they got videos prepared. That is the lecture, are these edX courses that are prepared by Harvard and MIT professors. The class time at the campus is used for discussion. They've experienced a lot of success, a lot of improved performance using this model. So this is the notion, and even Coursera is talking about this openly, and saying this is what the business they think that are going to be getting into very shortly. Uh, this is a shameless plug. Uh, to, uh, uh, very shortly, we're going to have a two-day online thing on the MOOC, in which we're going to try to explore exactly these sorts of aspects of how the MOOC is. Uh, I'm going to go through these very, very quickly. This is a... Altius Education, they have an environment, so they're not just using an LMS, they're using a whole environment. It's kind of like the dashboard I was talking about earlier. Um, and this is really the future of the LMS, where it, it's not just a collection of silent courses, but really is connected in a way that allows advisors and students to see much more holistically uh, where they're going. 
the University System of Georgia, they have, where they're throwing away the old academic calendar and saying, yes, we can get you through the degree, your degree program much quicker by throwing away all the uh, vacation time and saying that you can use self-paced modules, uh, use, go through this online program, and within three years get a bachelor's degree. So that's an experiment they're, they're working with right now. Southern New Hampshire University is probably one of the most interesting instances of competency-based learning. So here, there are no courses, there are no credit hours, no traditional faculty, and no grades. It's entirely competency-based to get your associates. And they do it by mentoring in the workplace. And they have, a, they're, they have a set of 90 competencies that you need to navigate in order to get your degree. And the way they do this is they have a staff coach. On, they don't give you a faculty member. They give you what they call a staff coach to get going with. They actually ask that you connect with peer networks for help. Um, you get a mentor in the workplace, and then you get a mentor in your family. Then this is their way, this is their network, this is their support network. They're proposing will allow students in a much more successful way to actually navigate their way to a degree. And we think that there can't be a Columbia or a Princeton or Harvard or Dartmouth online, but these guys are saying, yes, there will be. This is Minerva. They are proposing by 2015 to have a distributed online elite institution where there will be clusters of students in cities rather than um, all coming to one central geographic location. Okay, I'm going to skip through this because I'm out of time, really. Western governors, these are all models of folks, competency-based learning, these are all new models, approaches to um, post-secondary education. So very quickly, 10 things that we can do at home, I'm out of time. Um, one, I think it's important to act. We shouldn't be a deer in the headlines, but we should really begin to experiment. Uh, we should not only innovate ourselves, but we should also encourage our colleagues to uh, innovate as well. Um, we should use technology creatively and intelligently and not just hand it out and say, wow, just by handing out a gizmo, um, everything is going to work. Uh, the person who said this might surprise you was actually Stephen Jobs, who said it's not going to be technology handing out you know, gizmos that's going to help us at all. We need to be database and act on data. Um, we are, in my, in my group, is trying to promote evidence-based practice among community members. We need to adopt the notion of rapid prototyping and smart failure. I think those are important things. And incorporate design thinking in the way we approach our projects. We need to embrace Squirrel. I think we need to realize that we're in a collaborative space now where everything is a team sport. Um, and I think we need to think carefully about where our next meal is coming from. We need to metacogitate on things in the same way we tell learners it's important uh, to the metacognitional uh, aspect of things. <coughs> And the, on the MOOC, never, neither bless nor curse it. It's there, and we should work with it creatively to see what we can do with it. And we need to think ourselves, what is a college or university? We can approach this either as sort of, oh my gosh, everything is, you know, the world, the sky is falling. Or we can look at our rules and say, perhaps, uh, maybe some of the you can should be stricken. And we should open up the horizon a little bit more in front of us. Um, so I'm just going to pause through this and say thank you very much.